Here we find in this chapter that we have read many times lately, I return to 1 Samuel and I want you to visit there with me today. I want us to think about which camp do I belong in? Which camp do I belong in? There's three different camps that's presented in 1 Samuel and chapter 17. And I want you to ask yourself personally, you say, I'm not really concerned. I have my mind on other things. Well, that already says which camp you belong in. I want you to ask yourself today, which camp am I in? Which camp do I belong? And I want you to identify with me the three camps. And I want you personally, as you are here today before God, and I want you not to leave, leave here and daydream. Shame on you to do that. I want you to stay awake. I want you to listen. I want you to ask yourself, which camp do I belong in? The Bible tells us that Goliath had presented himself, and he stood before the Israelites, and he defied the armies of Israel. The scripture tells us in verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Why are you lined up for battle? It's an interesting question he asked them. Why did you come here today? For 40 days, this Philistine giant, physically, he comes and he stands and he opposes Israel and he asks them the question, why are you even here? Do you catch that? That's what he's asking. Why are you even here today? And I, I ask you today, and I, and I think the message is also to me as a preacher, to all of us as Christians, exactly why are you even here? Because there's a many time, many time, we come to church and it's no more than some big social gathering. We've made church not necessarily what God wants church to be. You've made church, I've made church something that we feel comfortable with. It doesn't challenge us. It keeps us safe in our own little community of believers. But it's not necessarily the church that God wants us to be. The Philistine recognized their fear and he recognized their complacency. And he says, there you are lined up. You've got on your helmets. You've got your swords. You've got your shields. You look like you're an army. You look like you're prepared to fight. And Goliath said, here I am. I give you the opportunity. And no one would come. And he said, then exactly why are you even here? Why did you even line up here today? And look what else he goes on to say. Am I just not a Philistine? And you... Not the servants of Saul. Two camps we've read about thus far. There's the camp of those who are the servants of Saul and the Philistines. There's one more. And if you'll follow with me, we know that David enters into the scene. And we have looked at scripture from the past. We've studied. But I want to jump ahead to verse 26. And David asked the men standing near him, what will be done to the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? That's what the Philistine Goliath was. He was a disgrace. And David asked the question, what happens to the man? How is he rewarded for those who take away this disgrace? And we read, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. There's a third camp. The armies of the living God. Now, I want to stop for a moment and let's go back and let's look at who were the Philistines. The Philistines were those who always defied God. They challenged God. They didn't respect God. They didn't have faith in God. They would laugh at God. They would try to rob from God. They would try to put the people of God in fear. They were jealous of God's blessings on Israel. You see, the Philistines were more than just a group of people that existed in that time era. There are Philistines today. There are those today who have little to any respect for God. They're jealous of God's people who come and rejoice and, re and give God praise. They are stubborn. They refuse to listen. They have no respect for God. And they
they have no faith in the living Jesus Christ. They are those who are the Philistines. And many are in that camp. Jesus said it this way. There are two roads in life. There's the broad way and there's the narrow way. The broad way leads to destruction. But the narrow way, which is by faith in God, it is the narrow way of which represents the armies of the living God. There's many people in that camp today, the Philistine camp. I hope you're not in that camp. There's many people that are. There are many people today who refuse to hear, refuse to listen, refuse to obey. They refuse Jesus Christ. Now I want you to listen for a moment. If you're a part of the camp of the Philistines, I want you to listen carefully. What you've done, you've placed yourself in a camp, and I want you to tell you something. You're going to lose. You've already lost. Because when you do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you've lost. Because he's the meaning of life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He is the giver of life. He is the light of the world. And if you don't have Jesus in your heart and in your family, in your life, you have already lost. It's not a question, am I going to have victory over God? If I stand my ground, someday I'll, I'll stand before God and I'm going to show Him who's boss. You've already lost because you've rejected Jesus Christ who loves you, who came and died for you on the cross, who God, who in His love and His infinite mercy sent Jesus Christ. You refuse to believe in Him. You refuse to listen to Him. You rejected His Word. And you will lose because you've already lost. You're lost without God. You've lost. You're separated from God. You're not enjoying God's blessings. You're living life your own stubborn way. And you've not listened and respected God. Because when you respect and listen to God, you're going to put yourself under God's command. Today, I know we're expecting this Thursday, many millions of people probably will tune in and turn on a debate and listen to two men probably sit and just criticize each other for 90 minutes and tell the world how bad the other person is. It's important who's president. It's important who's king, queen, whatever the country may be. But the truth, and the truth has always been, is that no country is blessed unless God is the Lord. And no person nor political party can resolve the problems we have in this country or in any country or in your life. There's only one person, and he's not the person. He is the Lord God Almighty. He and he alone, he can heal a nation. He can heal a family. He can heal your heart and mind. And Jesus Christ is his name. And so if America or the world is listening in to see who wins the debate, thinking that one of those men is going to save America, then that is the problem. Because we're looking to somebody or something that can't heal or do anything. It is only God who can bring salvation to this nation. That is true. And it is up to the Christian, it is up to us to preach that message to Republicans, Democrats, to all people, to Baptists, Catholics, non-denominational, Muslims, everyone needs to hear that there's only one who can heal a nation. There's only one who can heal a bleeding heart, and it is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Our hope as a nation is not in the Republican Party, and it's not in the Democrat Party. Our hope as a nation, whether you want to say it or believe it, our hope is in the living God. And God has demonstrated his love for you, for your family, for this church, for this country, and that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his name is Jesus, who died on the cross, and he was lifted from the grave. He lives today, he's alive, and Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and only peace and joy is known when you put your life under his command. 
We need Jesus as King and Lord in our personal life, in your family, in your marriage. You need Jesus Christ as your personal Lord, and this country needs Jesus. And until this country is willing to respect and turn to God and repent and turn away from sin and to believe in Christ and to believe in God's word, there is no hope. You've already lost because you are lost. Does that make sense? That is the Philistine camp. Then there's another camp. And here we read about it. The Philistine giant, he says, am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? And that's the reason no one would fight. They were just the servants of Saul. Who do you see yourself in your mind today? It is true. It is true today. If you're listening to this message by video, it is true. I belong to the Southern Baptist denomination. But in my mind, I'm much more than a Southern Baptist. I'm much more than any denomination can label me. You see, by faith in Christ, I'm a child of God. The scripture says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. John 1, 12. Based on God's word, I, in my mind, I am a child of God. Jesus said, you must be born again. I've been born again by the Spirit of God. He lives in me. He dwells in me. In my mind, I am a child of the King. God lives in me. I'm a temple of God. And that is more than being a Baptist or any denomination. You fill in the blank. I hope today you have in your mind that you're more than just being a religious person. That you can stand and say, I'm not afraid, nor am I going to be complacent. I'm going to step out onto the battlefield. I'm going to be accountable to God because I know in my mind, in my heart, I'm a child of the living God. And I am going to serve Him. Whether anyone else steps out there with me, I'm walking out onto that valley because I'm a child of God. And God is alive in me today. He holds me in his hand. My name is literally written in his heart. I have my name written, recorded in the book of life. God has promised me that he has given me his spirit. His spirit will never leave me. He has given me the guarantee that someday he's going to come again. And I'm going to be with him in heaven. And right now I'm to serve God. I'm to be obedient to God. I'm going to be faithful to God. And regardless of what you do, what you do, I am going to be responsible to God. And I'm going to step out by faith. And I'm going to say, Goliath, here I am. And I'm not going to allow you to keep me in fear. I'm not going to run away. Because greater is God than you. You see, there's those who are in the camp of Saul. And in the camp of Saul, you'll find nothing but religious complacency and backslidden Christians. How do you know if you're a backslidden Christian? You say, well, it's easy. You're going backwards. This yesterday, we moved for how many hours? About eight hours or more. Sundays, sometimes I didn't know if I was going backwards or forwards. Landon and I had a piece of furniture. I think he did it on purpose, I don't know, but it had like a, a fixture that came off this bench and it had a place, I don't know why all those rollers were there, but put, putting paper towels, I don't know exactly what purpose they served. All I know is, is that every time he pushed, they were hitting me in the forehead. And we were carrying, and I think Samantha intentionally filled every drawer with nails and staples and metal. It was so heavy that if we dropped it, it would still be going to the center of the earth. And we carried it up and down steps, up the ramp, down the ramp, and we just kept carrying this piece of furniture. And Samantha, we got home, and I said, well, if it's here, if it gets wet, it'll ruin. And she said, well, if it gets wet, we'll just get rid of it. <laughs> I thought, are you kidding me? I just bled and died for that piece of furniture. I'm going to put a tarp on that baby. I'm going to keep it dry. 
But the point is that sometimes we think of being backslidden as falling backwards, but that's not what it means to be a backslidden Christian. You know what it means? It means you're just standing still. You're not moving forward. Because Jesus called us to move forward. We're the people who God gave the command, go. Moses, go. David, go. Jesus preached to his disciples, go. You see, we're to move forward and not hide in fear. We're not to be complacent and say, I'm just going to let everyone else do it. I'm okay where I'm at right now. But let me ask you something. Are you where God wants you to be right now? It's not a question, are you okay with where you are? The question we ought to be asking as a Christian, am I where God wants me to be? Because if you're complacent, it's been a long time since we've had a baptism here. Does that break your heart? It's been a long time since we have seen someone in this church building come to know Jesus. Does that break your heart? It's been a long time since we've seen family and friends from the community in this church building. Does that break your heart? Listen, if you can go through as Christians, as me, as a minister, and we're all ministers in God's kingdom. We all are. If we're okay with this, then you're the camp of salt. You've got on all the armor that looks religious. And you're standing there with the rest of everyone else saying, here I am. I came to church today. I got my Bible in my hand. I got it right here. People carry it around as though just because they carry around a Bible, they've done something. If the Bible's not written in your heart and you're not faithful to it, then you might as well just set it back down. Because it's just a book. And if just coming to this Baptist church and all we got to do is put on, it's hot in here today. You probably see the sweat coming through my shirt. I don't know. But if this is all I am, to come in here and sing five songs and hold up a Bible and speak for 25 minutes or something like that, is that all I am? You see, that's, the, that's of the camp of Saul. But when we are listened as Christians, when we're praising God, worshiping God at home, and at work, at school, and we're taking Jesus out of the church into the world and sharing Christ with our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our dads, our siblings, our families, those we work with, those we go to school with. When you unashamedly, without apology, stand upon the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, and start sharing Jesus because you love Him and you're obedient to Him, that's when you come out of the camp of Saul and you join the camp of the living God. Amen. You see, that day, there was only one person we see in that camp. Isn't that interesting? There's those who were in the camp of Saul, but all they did was hide. They were afraid to even step out. But there's one boy named David. And he identifies himself as being in the army of the living God. What camp are you in? You see, when you're in a camp of the living God, you're not persuaded by others. That day, there was a large number of people in the camp of Saul but they were persuaded by each other. They say, ooh, look how big that guy is. What's his name? Goliath. Listen to how loud he is. He's carrying, look, that looks like a, a weaver's beam. They say, that's no weaver's beam. That's his javelin. Look at his sword. Look at the size of his shield. He's going to kill any one of us. He's going to take us and break us like a twig. And they all started whispering. And before it was over, there was no one willing to step out for God. They were willing to live with the disgrace. There's a many a Christian today, they're willing to live with disgrace in their home, in their marriage, in their life, in their church. We're willing to accept it. Say, well, this is the way it is. We live in 2024. We just had a parade. It's still going on, I think, this month, right? We're okay with that. Actually, as Christians, we've learned to become okay with everything. We speak. It's hard to tell the difference, right? Hear people say, well, I'm going to be a leader for God. They're on television talking about how important it is to have 
the Ten Commandments and that, and they curse and carry on. Either you're going to step out for God and be part of his army, or either you're in, but there's no middle ground. That's for me, and that's for all of us. That's called a hypocrite. And I know how to play that game. I've done it. It's easy. You put on the face of religion. You take a stand with others. But when the day comes, the hour is near for us to stand out and become the people of God. We're silent, we're hidden, and we're shamed. Except for David. This young teenage boy reminds us, when you have it in your mind and heart who you are, it changes who you behave. David, the Bible says, he was a member of the camp of the living God. Amen? He was a member of the camp of the living God. Yes, Fred. You sure can. David was a member of the camp of the living God. You know that camp? Here, here's how you recognize it. We have a few minutes. Listen. Regardless of your age, you're always ready to serve God. Regardless of your age. Regardless of what others say or do, you're always ready to serve God. So others may say that you don't have the talent, you don't have the looks, you're not able, you're not doing this, you're not behaving like everyone else. You're not worried about that because you're under the command of God. And what God says, that's all that matters. That's all that mattered 2,000 years ago. That's all that matters today. And that's all that's going to matter tomorrow to you. You're of the living God and you're going to serve him regardless who else is out there. David walked out on that battlefield that day. No one else was standing there, but he knew that God was with him. God was in everything he did. Because when you're a member of the camp of the living God, God is going to be the one who fights your battles. That's what makes you have faith. Because you're not standing out there because you've got stronger arms or bigger brains. You walk out by faith because God has promised you, I'm going before you and I'm going to give you the victory. We read the scripture last time. I read just one verse. I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to close momentarily. But it's so fitting. Would you go back to the book of Deuteronomy? And God gives the people of Israel this command. And you see, as you read this, it's very clear how the people, the Israelites, had become backslidden. Because when you're backslidden, God's word is silent. You don't hear it anymore. God's voice is no longer heard when you're backslidden. In, in the 20th chapter, look at verse 1 of Deuteronomy. When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, stop for a moment. Is that the situation Israel was in? It was, right? They saw an army that was bigger, physically stronger, mightier, and this is exactly what God was saying to them many, many years before by Moses. God said, when you find yourself in that situation, here's what God says. Do not be afraid. I don't want you to be afraid. Here's what else he says. Because the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. And verse, look, verse 2, chapter 20 of Deuteronomy, verse 2. And when you are about to go into battle, the priest, who is our great high priest, Jesus, shall come forward and address the army. Here's what he'll say. Hear, O Israel, today you're going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. Now, who's God speaking to? His promise is to you. You say, oh, it says Israel. God is speaking to you. And God says, our high priest, Jesus, is saying, don't be faint-hearted. Don't give up. Don't panic. But here's what he says in verse 4. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. That's God's promise. And if you're part of that camp, then you're always going to be the first one to serve. You're always going to be the first one to step out by faith. Not given to fear and complacency, 
But because of your faith in God's word, you're going to step out and you're going to have victory in your life. Because you're in the camp of the living God. I'm not in the camp of religion or Saul. Remember, Saul took armor and he put it on David. And the Bible says, look, it's, I got to close with that. I love that text. You remember what he says to him? Look, go back to 1 Samuel, and I promise we're going to close with this. Remember now he's about to go out into the battlefield. He convinces Saul that he is going to go out and fight Goliath. And look what Saul does. Go back to 1 Samuel and look at chapter 17. Are you there? Look at verse 38. And Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head, this teenage boy. Look at verse 39. And David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he wasn't used to them. I want to stop for a minute. Can you see that, this teenage boy? I see Mason. Mason's walking around. King Saul has put on his big helmet. He's handing him all this equipment. And there Mason is walking around. And he's clumsy. He says, I'm not used to wearing this armor. Why? Because when you're in the camp of the living God, you're wearing the armor of God. And you don't need religious armor. You need faith. You need the word of God. You need to put on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. Amen? And look what he goes on to say. And now here he says to Saul. Now listen, here's what he says. Everyone, I want you to pay close attention to the last part of verse 39. David says, I cannot go in these, he says to Saul, because I am not used to them. In some translations, it reads, these are not tested. I've not tested these. You see, what David was saying is, King Saul, as I told you, I have fought a bear. I have fought a lion. I have fought every day of my life. I have fought some kind of a Goliath. And I have learned I don't need this kind of worldly or religious armor. I have the armor of God. And I have tried. I've tested God. And God has proven to me time and time again. I can believe in his word. I can stand upon his promises. And I am going to defeat that giant. Not wearing this. This armor, but I'm going to wear the armor of the living God. And today I'm going to have victory. Why? Because I have victory every day when you're walking with Jesus. This isn't going to be something new for David. This is just something everyday life. Something to remember, isn't it? You think sometimes we, we preach the wrong message. I've heard it sometimes preached. I'm not saying here. I've just heard it sometimes. And I'm not going to judge any minister. But you say, if you live for the Lord, your life is just going to be filled with wealth and good. and You're going to be rich. But it's not the riches of this world. You're going to be rich in God's grace and wisdom and His love. God doesn't ever promise some of the things that we preach from our pulpits. And we need to be careful because it teaches people, listen, to be looking for something that's not going to happen. I say this to you, if you walk with God and you're living for Jesus, you need to expect every day there's going to be some form of Goliath walking out in front of you. Learn now not to hide in fear, but to stand by faith in God and say, just like you delivered me yesterday, you're going to deliver me today. And all of my friends and the church there in Reading, they're going to see my faith. It's going to encourage them. And I'm going to give glory to my Father in heaven. And when it's over with, I'm going to have victory. But I'm not going to receive the glory for it because I live for one reason. And it's to honor my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when the battle's over, the people will start screaming and shouting, praise God. That's your purpose in every battle. Not to bring glory to yourself, but to bring glory to God. Why? Because you belong to the army of the living God. You say such terminology is not found in the New Testament. I differ with you. Paul says to Timothy, he says these words, endure hardship as though you are a soldier of the cross. I'm a soldier. I'm a member of the living God's army. You say, what does it mean to be an army? Well, TJ, you're in the army. I believe we're in the army. Sarge. Sergeant TJ. Sergeant, yes, sir. Now it's Sergeant Jennifer. Hey, yeah. He got married and he met his new sergeant. 
But the truth is, you know what an army is? It's a group. This is, is it, tell me if I'm wrong, because you're in the army. I wasn't. I'm sorry I didn't serve, but TJ, you did. Alan, others. When you're a member of the Marines, the Army, is it not a group of men and women? You kind of lose that identity, right? Once you join the Army, it's not about being a man or woman anymore. You're now a member of a unit, which means no longer individuals, but one. You have one purpose, you have one mind, you have one direction, you have one loyalty, and you're fighting as one. And it's not for your individual glory, but it is for those that you have pledged allegiance to. And as a Christian, I have pledged allegiance to the Savior, for whose kingdom I now stand. And I rejoice with my brothers and sisters in Christ that together we are here as part of God's living army. We have one purpose. We have one mind, we have one direction, and together, let us serve God in faith. Would you stand, please? There will be a hymn of invitation here today, and maybe in your heart you need to come and say, Lord, I'd like to belong to that army of the living God. I don't want to be considered a backslidden person. I don't want to stand complacent or fearful. I don't want to be that kind of Christian anymore. I want to come out and serve God. I want to be seen not because I'm afraid, but I want to be seen because I'm faithful. Maybe you just need to come and renew your commitment to Jesus. But we're going to have a time of invitation. Lord, give this invitation. If anyone needs to know the Lord, today is the hour. Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day to receive Christ. In their heart, I pray today that they would open up by faith and say, Lord Jesus, come in. I trust in you that you died for my sins, that you were raised again. I repent. I seek your forgiveness. And I seek to walk a new life. By your help, help me to live in Jesus. Father, give this invitation, I pray. Amen.